Hey, Derby Con, how's everybody doing this morning? All right. Well, I want to welcome you to Mirai Satori OMG Arari IoT Botnets. Oh my. A little bit about me. Uh, I work on the Threat Intel team at NetScout, where I focus on IoT, Linux, and mobile malware. I'm a recovering pen tester. Uh, I've done everything from network pen testing to uh, IoT software, hardware, and back end service testing. Today's agenda, we're going to look at how Mirai has been used as a framework for IoT bot net authors. We'll take a look at three specific IoT variances. Those are Satori, OMG, Mirai. We'll look at how each of them have used Mirai as a framework to, uh, to build upon, and then also additional flair that they've added to make it their own. Next, we'll look at tricks and techniques you can use when analyzing IoT-based malware. We'll talk about some best practices about, uh, around defending against IoT bots. And finally, we'll open it up to any questions you all may have. In August of 2016, the internet was hit with some high-profile, high-impact DDoS attacks. These DDoS attacks were associated with Mirai. Mirai targeted IoT devices. And some of you may be asking, what's an IoT device? Well, you can think of an IoT device as any system or any hardware that's running an embedded operating system that can send and receive data on the network. Common IoT devices that you'll see out there are IP-based cameras, cable DSL modems, and DVR systems. Mirai supported several architectures such as ARM, MIPS, x86, and PowerPC. The reason for this is because a lot of these IoT devices have these different chipsets. Not all of them are based on ARM, not all of them have MIPS or PowerPC on them. They're across the board. When Mirai came out, its attack vector was to use default credentials and scan for Telnet. So what it do is scan the internet, look for any devices that would have Telnet available, and then use uh, a set list of default credentials. These default credentials could be anything that were set from the uh, factory time when the user received the device, or even credentials that were hard-coded by uh, support organizations such as you know maybe your DSL modem, your cable modem may have a back uh, door password on there so they can get in there, update any firmware, that type of stuff. Now we fast forward to September of two, uh, 2016. The author of Mirai decides to, hey, I'm going to open source or release my code. Pretty much talks about why he got into it. and also kind of made fun of people that were doing analysis on the bot itself. Um, once he open sourced it or released it or leaked it, however you want to look at it, we started seeing several variants come out based on Mirai. Here's the following graph of uh, just the year-to-date of ingestion of different types of variances that were based on Mirai. You see several peaks and valleys here. These peaks and valleys are generally related to when a new variant comes out that adds additional functionality or adds um, additional attack vectors or implements some sort of new IoT vulnerability that has been released. Uh, examples uh, are like uh, the GPON exploit or the Realtek SDK exploit. Now that we have a kind of a background of Mirai, let's take a look at three specific variances and how they've leveraged Mirai as a framework and then built upon it to add their own flair. The first one we'll take a look at is Satori. Followed by OMG, and then we'll wrap it up with Mirai. Satori. Satori emerged in late 2017. Since then, there have been several variances of Satori. Uh, analyzing Satori, you can see it heavily used Mirai as a framework. Uh, several functions map between the two, and we'll take a look at some of that. The original version used the default credential scanner just like Mirai, but other variances of Satori then started to implement uh, other exploit techniques uh, such as um, remote, code ex remote command execution vulnerabilities and uh, some other ones which we'll dive a little bit deeper into. Uh, one cool thing about Satori was it's the first bot to support the Arch architecture. Uh, no other bots so far has come out to support that architecture. Now let's take a look at some of the code sharing that Satori uses from Mirai. This first example here see 
table and it functions. You can think of it as a, like a configuration table. In there, it stores information about like where the CNC domain is or where the CNC port is. And these values are stored, if you look at the strings, they're stored uh, obfuscated. And we'll look at that obfuscation technique here in a minute. On the right hand side here, we see Satori's, uh, the pseudo C for Satori's configuration file. We see the same type of function where we're adding in our table index, we add our obfuscated value, and then the size and length of that value. Now, I talked about how Satori and Rai obfuscates their information. We can see that they both leverage the same function. The original Mirai source had this export function here. So if you look at the previous table, Key that was used when the source was leased. That key is what's used to obfuscate each of those data settings. Sorry, did the same thing. Use the same function to obfuscate those strings, but use different keys. So you weren't seeing the same dead beef. They may have used uh, different incantations of that, but same function. Very easy to figure out what those uh, encrypted or those uh, XOR strings were. The reason for the XOR could have been a couple of things: one, to bypass maybe IDS, IPS types of situations, or to make it difficult for reversers or blue team members just to be able to run strings and figure out, oh, hey, here's a domain that it uses, here's a port it uses. In later variances, though, Satori swapped out its XOR function for a bit swap, which we see the pseudocode here. So it swapped the bits, and then it would call this base64 encode or decode function, and it would encode or decode the actual string itself. And here's the, the base64 uh, encoder or decoder, and as you can see, I mean, nothing special. It's nothing revolutionary, just kind of reusing uh, basic techniques. Mariah originally used a Telnet, or, you know, a Telnet scanner, more or less, and then we looked for default credentials. Satori did the same, but then it kind of upped its game by introducing uh, IoT-based vulnerabilities, such as the Re Realtek SDK. Here's this uh, assembly for uh, a variant that was leveraging this exploit. And here we can see the exploit and the string being built for it. If we take a look at the payload itself, we can see what's actually going on. You see the exploit right here, followed by command injection, where it's using WGIC to download a copy of Satori and run it on device. Similar, Satori used the GPON exploit, same type of fashion. Here's a, a MIP sample, and we can see the string being built. And if we look at the payload, we see the same type of signature here where we're running our command injection and telling it to download a version of Satori and run it. The last example here of uh, vulnerability or attack that Satori added uh, is kind of one of my favorites. Um, around late August time frame, middle of August, we saw a huge uptick in scanning for port 5555. And for those Android people out there, you know exactly what that port is. That's the ADB port. So Satori would sit there and scan the internet, look for any systems that had ADB open, and then would issue the following command to connect to ADB and issue uh, a request to download a sample and run that sample to, again, infect the device and add it to its botnet. So we can see here through the evolution of Satori the addition of, of new uh, techniques to gain access and building upon Mirai. Next example I want to talk about is OMG. OMG was discovered in early 2018, another Mari based variant. What's cool about OMG is the authors uh, decided to integrate a proxy server for both uh, HTTP proxy and a SOX proxy into it. And uh, similar to other variants, it used default credentials. If we simply run strings on the binary, we get a good indication of maybe what proxy it may run. As you can see here, it's using three proxy. Let's take a look at how OMG sets up this proxy. Here's a, a function that was inside OMG that actually gets the, the proxy portion set up. What it does is it first creates random ports for both the uh, proxy, the HTTP proxy and the SOX proxy. Then it goes through and we see this function called, which I cleverly named, IP tables. And what this does is it uh, either enables or disables IP tables on a device so that the uh, botnet author can connect to it and proxy through it. Uh, part of this function, too, would also send information on what ports those are to its CNC so they know which one to connect to. And if we look at 
the actually uh, the IP tables function, we see how this is done. So it takes the random forest to generate string data and then create. And how it does that is it stores the IP tables command in that similar uh, table configuration file, similar to Mirai. And it pulls that value out and then substitutes it in in the string and then returns that info or uh, calls the command to either enable or disable it based on what the C2 has said. And if we go look at that configuration table, we see the same type of uh, table setting where we have our values here, which are, again, obfuscated. And it uses that table to reference where that information is and pull it out. And we can see the actual IT IP table command right here, where this one specifically talks about uh, dropping the table. So once it enabled these ports or disabled, once it enabled the ports, um, it needed to set up the proxy. We need to get those ports uh, listening on the system and whatnot. Here's the function that handled it. When we look at the function, we can see how it calls the proxy command and with the variable and then variable takes the port listing down. Further down, we need additional configuration of the NS server uh, options to use. Oh, still. <laughs> these uh, server options to use along with the cache server and, and so forth. If we look at the configuration file on GitHub, we can see the exact same options here. So we can kind of get a good indication that the author just quickly copied this over just to get it up and running and get it out there. The last variant I want to look at is called uh, Arari. Arari and Wiki were discovered in 2018. Both were based on uh, Mirai. Arari is, is a funny story, and we'll get into it here in a minute. Uh, Arari originally used the default credentials similar to basic Mirai. Then it was updated to include additional uh, command execution vulnerabilities. There's a version uh, variant called Wicked that was discovered, and part of Wicked's main purpose in life was to download copies of Arari. So it's a good indication that these two families were tied together. And Wicked targeted uh, specific Netgear routers and CCTV DVRs. Similar to Mirai, Arari used the same type of CSU set up information. Uh, in the Mirai example here, we unlock the table to get the domain, and then we also unlock the table to get the port. Which is here is Arari decided to hard code its IP address, which it makes our life a lot easier. Because we don't have to do that. So we can jump in, we can find the actual door. It's not that difficult, it does save time. But still leveraging the configuration. Not sure why they chose this setup versus just either hard coding both or just putting them in a configuration table. Who knows? Here's the uh, function that looks for the default credentials. We can see the ones that were included are already. We're going to go through and add these two other ones that both specifically match. Once it found one that it matched, then it would move forth from there. So it used this until they got some love on Twitter. Here's a post that was put up pretty much making fun of or poking at the fact that RR used, you know, old school, old technique, telling that in response to this Twitter feed or this Twitter post, uh, the authors introduced uh, some vulnerability, uh, the, this uh, CVE, and attacked this to gain access. As I said, Wicked uh, was also associated with Arari. Uh, here's the different exploits that were used from Wicked, and we can see the same, similar pattern Phrases or words. And the last one is kind of a, a funny thing. Um, the reason for it, I really don't understand why they're doing it. They need to show off the exact manner. But within the Mirai configuration table, they also made it possible to string letting the owner of the device know that it's been compromised. Uh, so we see that, again, storing the information within the table, unobfuscating it, writing it out to the uh, different portions of the file system, and then who will ask you? We still see these attacks, and they're still going on. Um, they're not going away. They're not slowing down. We'll still see variants using this. Here's just an example of uh, 
point of time in the beginning of August where we're seeing traffic. This is from our honeypot, collecting data of attacks that are being run in the wild. They're trying to uh, stand for the The other one you can see down here, not as high frequency, but still there. On the other, this is what we saw in some of the previous examples. And people still use Telnet. So now that we've talked about all these variances, how do we analyze them in a quick and efficient fashion? From a blue team's perspective, our goal is to figure out what new functionality they have, what new exploits they have, so we can kick out our IOCs. As part of the source that was released from Mirai, there's a build script to make your life easier. In the build script, there's a use of strip. And for those that are not familiar with strip, what it does is it removes any type of symbols in the binary, which makes it difficult to reverse. And when it, I say symbols, it's stuff like what fork is and stuff like that, which makes you have to go through and figure out, okay, where are all these system calls to be able to trace it. So what you'll see is you'll just see the basic assembly. You'll see a SVC zero in the ARM world, and then you'll see the variable that's being passed to it to tell you what system call is. So you have to figure that out by yourself. But in some cases, the author gets lazy and just leaves full symbols there. So it's very easy to figure out which attacks are in use, what call it is, before and after, and whatnot. This, from a blue team's perspective or analyst's perspective, makes our life really easy. But what happens when you don't have that? You don't have these symbols, you get the strip binary. Why not use the source code the same way that a botnet author does. Why not leverage that to help us build signatures to be able to quickly analyze these variants to figure out what has changed? There's two tools I'm going to talk about real quick here is Deforia and Rizzo, which allows us to quickly analyze these samples. And if authors are here that wrote those, thank you. Deforia. You can think of Deforia as, as bin diff. And everybody get the screenshot? There you go. So, how Deforia works is first you compile your unscripted. Index information about what functions are there and kind of like signatures around those functions. Then what you can do is apply it to your strip binary. So here's a variant of Mirai where we see the default IO labeling. This is a screen from the Foria. Foria has different matches of top names. So the top names are green and spot on. And you can see here this is the table of on function. And if you look at the source that it matches on, if you look at the pseudo key for it, the on strips are an obfuscation uh, function. Rizzo. Rizzo is another favorite tool of mine. I love Rizzo. Uh, Rizzo uh, builds like signatures uh, that you can apply against the strip binary. So like, similar fashion, you create your Mirai variant that's not, or your, uh, you build your version of Mirai for the architecture you want to test with or analyze. Make sure you don't strip the symbols. Then you use Rizzo to create uh, a pattern file or a signature file. Here's the strip binary. This is what we see. We see the functions over here that aren't labeled, just the default IDA labeling. We see the assembly. Nothing, no real good clues here. You know, a lot of work to try to figure out some just of the basic functionality. But once we apply the Rizzo database, bam, we start seeing great information here. We can see what it shares with the Mirai variant. What the Mirai variant shares with the variant that we want to see that we can pull the Rizzo off of. You see the function names right here, which gives us Looks like any tool, it's not 100%. So you're not going to get 100% one-to-one matches all the time. Sometimes Rizzo or Deforia messes up and doesn't catch the right function. So a lot of times you just double check to make sure, but it does help reduce the noise. Another example um, of you know using Rizzo and Deforia, it's not just limited to Mirai. Uh, recently, there was a new bot that came out called Tori. Um, this bot was built off of uh, ulibc. So what we can do with the same type of kind of idea in mind, we can build a Rizzo file or a Deforia diff database based off of ulibc and then apply that to the strip version of Tori to help us identify these uh, common functions like uh, memcopy or memalex. So we don't have to sit there and figure out, oh, well, we see this type of pattern here. Okay, this has to be memcopy. So Tori and Deforia does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Defending against IoT bots, uh, what can we do you know, to help reduce the risk of this? From the manufacturer side, we can start looking at doing 
code reviews. Make sure code, secure code reviews and security assessments are being done against the devices during development time, not as an afterthought or a bolt on that. Okay, we have the chipsets, we have all this stuff. Now let's do the security review when we're kind of locked into using the technology and the hardware. From the user side, basic, basic thing we can do is change the password right away. Let's not leave those default passwords admin admin and let our devices be used as a bot. From an enterprise perspective, if we're using like DVRs or IP-based cameras, let's do ingress and egress filtering. You know, simple things that we can prevent anybody on the internet from attacking. There's no reason that anybody on the internet should be able to access my DVR or my IP-based camera. And from the user's perspective also, we need to make sure that we're applying or subscribing to the manufacturer's security updates. And once we get that message coming in, we need to apply those patches and make sure that those devices are getting patched in a timely manner. So in summary, IoT devices are not going away, nor are malware targeting them. It, just because of the simple fact of how many devices there are out there. It's a huge footprint and it's a very juicy target. You know, security around IoT is like that of late 90s on PCs. We see the same type of issues that we saw back then. We see default credentials, we see easy command injection, code execution, that type of stuff we still see. And from you know, a blue team perspective, let's leverage the source. Botnet authors are doing it, why can't we? To help us reduce the time it takes to analyze these things and pull out these IOCs. And lastly, we should be thinking of IoT devices the same as our, our PCs and our servers. They should be added to our regular uh, security testing, you know, any type of network pen tests or web app pen tests, these devices should be thrown in there, along with our regular patching cycle. You know, most corporations have a regular date where they're doing their patches. They're patching their Microsoft system, they're patching their applications. These IoT devices should be included along with that patching cycle. That's it. Well, thank you guys for coming. I'll open it up for any questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've thought about is actually attacking um, not only that, uh, since you have the source Mirai, you also have the um, CNC server. Reviewing the CNC server, see if there's any vulnerabilities there, and attacking the CNC server and taking it over and shutting it down that way. So there's a lot of these bots. I mean, um, the authors are not, I would say, the most security conscious coders. So yeah, there's a lot of bugs in them that we can leverage from a blue team perspective to, you know, either sh use those to shut them down or whatnot. But that's one of those things you need to probably talk to your legal group. <laughs> no problem. Anybody else? Any questions? All right, I'll be here for the rest of the con. Thank you, guys. <laughs>